Welcome to this talk following this fantastic film, Heart of the Dog. My name is Camilla Larsson, and I'm a programmer for the festival, a journalist and film critic. And I first saw this film at its premiere at the Venice Festival in uh, September. And when you go to film festivals, you always leave uh, having one film especially left in your heart. It doesn't necessarily have to be the biggest film or anything, but you, you go home with that one. And from Venice this year, mine was Heart of the Dog. So I'm extremely happy to be here tonight and that it's a full house like this. So please introduce again the director and uh, artist, filmmaker, musician, everything, as Jonas said before, Laurie Anderson. And we also have another guest. Please welcome the Swedish writer, playwright, artist, comedian, and specialist on Laurie Andersson, Jonas Gadell. Oh. Okay, finally we are here. You said before the film, uh, Laurie, that uh, you didn't want to make a film about uh, your philosophy. And then I read somewhere in an interview that you said that uh, if you were Woody Allen, you would have called the film Love and Death. So I want to start by asking you, what, what is the film about for you? Because I think everybody can have their own interpretation of it. Well, um, Hello. In the end, uh, it, it was my philosophy of life. So, you know, they tricked me into it. So, uh, I, yeah, I hadn't started out like that, but it, it turned out to be kind of like a lot of ideas about, um, uh, of course, how our stories made is really what it, what it was uh, initially about, because that's the material that I work with, is stories. So I thought, uh, what are they? How do you make them? How do you forget them? What happens when somebody else tells you a story uh, that or, or frames you with, with, their, with their words? Jonas, I know you've seen the film a couple, at least two times during the week. So yeah. what are you, your thoughts on it? What, what do you think? What it's about for you and uh, the themes? Uh, to me, it's, it's uh, of course, it's about my, my mother. <laughs> Mm. It's about my mother and, and me uh, trying to understand her. But that's also always the, the, the film. I mean, you see the film and you see it through your own life and your own, own experiences. And so to me, it was about my mother. And uh, of course, it's for Laura Anderson, it's not about my mother. <laughs> uh, I talked to your mother about yeah, this. Yeah, but you, know, you never met her. But it's it's um, but, but but to me also is that I, I have a, since I have a relation to to the uh, artistry of Laura Anderson since, since I was a youngster, uh, I also see the film. I when I first met Laura Anderson as an artist, uh, she uh, I was young, but so so were you. And now I see the same artist, but slightly older and more experienced, and, and with, with all the experience that changed you, but yours also, also, of course, still the same. And I think that is extremely interesting. If you follow an artist such as you for for decade after decade to see what's happening. Yeah, I think time is a big theme in the, in the movie, and and also it affects, of course, how you tell your stories. One of the stories in the film is the story of uh, breaking my back. All these stories are true, by the way, so guaranteed true. Was so. the story about your, the, your, uh, uh, the, twin, the twin siblings? Yes, yeah, yeah, my brothers, yeah. And I'll get to those guys in a second, but I, I just wanted to say, for example, in this story about breaking my back, you know, I, I, uh, we, you all have, I mean, everyone has their couple of, stories they drag out when you say what kind of kid were you and you it's a short story it's like i was a loner i was a bookworm i was a, you know and people don't really generally want an, a long answer to that you know so you have the short answer um and any more than they want the short answer to how was your day you know 
They don't really want to know that. And of course, it's not a, a question of stories. It's a question of social glue. How are you? How are you? How was your day? That's it. But um, with these childhood stories, you also have one of my my typical go-to stories as a child about my childhood was I broke my back and I thought adults were idiots and doctors were idiots and uh, so on. I mean, just the way any twelve-year-old punk thinks, you know, they don't even want to be around adults. They're they're embarrassing, you know. So um, I was that kind of kid, and and um, but here's the thing, you tell the stories that you can tell, and so as a twelve-year-old, I I wasn't really ready to be in this. Adults are idiots. They put all the children together in the same ward, and at night I I didn't know how to really. When that kid who was next to me died, I I was not really ready to make a story about that. So my story was, doctors don't know anything, and I'm going to walk, and you know, it was like that. So when I thought of that story much later in my life, the story that the 12-year-old told, I realized, you know, there's another way to tell that story. Um, with my twin brothers at the end, um, of course, this is, this is a uh, a work, as I said, about stories and how you tell them. So it begins with a story, a, a speech, um, by my mother, who was uh, giving a speech on her deathbed, and she was a very formal woman, very, very reserved. And so when she gave her deathbed speech, she gave it, waited for her eight kids to show up, and then she sort of steps up to a microphone and goes, thank you all for coming. And we're like, wow. <laughs> and then she gets a little distracted, like, because she was such a great, sportswoman. She loved horses and dogs. She was a great rider and starts talking to the animals um, on the ceiling and then back to you, to history, saying goodbye and, and you know, meanwhile the language is just shredding. It's falling apart. It, it becomes, you know, so, f it's just uh, has no relation. Ha ha ha, you know, it's so it's the, the fallibility of language. At the end of the film I needed a way to get to another, I needed an engine, and that engine turned out to be some, some film that you just mentioned of my twin brother. So my older brother said, I have a box of film from our childhood, and I know you're making a movie, could you just transfer this film? And I was like, I'm kind of busy, <laughs> but I said, okay, okay. So I transferred it, and out of that box from the lab came a whole lost, you know, winter world of my mother pushing my little brothers in their strollers and uh, me ice skating and the, the island and uh, everything. Uh, and I called my brothers and I said, guys, do you remember when that, that time when I almost killed you? Uh, and they said, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and you know why? Is because they're identical twins. And they, they didn't really speak English until they were six. They had their own twin language. So our family was the subject of this twin language study, and we kind of knew some of their songs and some of the, they had a kind of mythology. And imagine, you know, what, what uh, it's very different to be an identical twin, because you're born with somebody who understands you. You don't have to spend your whole life looking for someone who's going to understand you. You're born with that person. So you have this back and forth, it's like an outboard brain, you know, so you talk about what happened and so they remembered quite well when they were two years old and they slid under the ice because it was pretty terrifying. And so, of course, anytime you come back, a kid comes back to their parents and, and is holding their two little frozen brothers and, they, you know, they almost drowned them there. Most parents would say, you know, what? were you thinking about, you, you, you almost drowned your, your little brothers. And, and I know that that idea uh, passed through my mother's mind, but because she was a kind of Confucian, she was, she let it go, and she didn't say that. And she said instead, um, what a good swimmer you were. <laughs> And there are many kinds of ways to express love, and uh, and many. Uh, so that was what she could do, you know. She was not one of these. I don't know. Was your mother a, a fuzzy mother? A kind of uh, kind of mother was she? 
my mother was Because yeah. this reminded you of your mother yeah, somehow. It, it, yeah, it, my mother was insane, actually. <laughs> in, in, but in, in the beginning in a nice way, and in the end of her life in a more ugly way. Uh, but uh, speaking about mothers, when Mark, my husband's uh, grandmother, she was a businesswoman, and when she died in Stockholm, she was from, was from Finland, all the relatives, all her families came, came to the hospital in Stockholm, and when everybody has arrived, she rose up in bed and said, I want to thank all the customers. <laughs> <laughs> Never too late to and thank died. the customers. <laughs> and the family <laughs> stood there, <laughs> unwanted. And when my mom died, my, my mother didn't know whether her mother had ever loved her, yeah. as you say yeah. in the film. And that is, I think, an important question for a child, even if the child is a grown-up. Yeah. I'm not sure that my mom loved me. And my mom knew only the moment her mother died. Mm -hmm. Because on her deathbed, my grandmother's deathbed, my mother was lying like like this, looking up, like this. Mm -hmm. And then she remembered something. This was the view she had as a baby when her mother was breastfeeding oh. her. And when her mother died, she recognized the eyes of a loving, loving eyes, un with, with un unconditional love. So therefore, to, for me also, the question of did you ever love me? It's, it's like an important mm -hmm. question. May I change subject because I do have some questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think you. I, I'll tell you if <laughs> I'll tell you yeah, to if, stop if, if, maybe if I if think it's, you should. If it's <laughs> yeah. irrelevant or uninteresting, just yeah. go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in in the beginning of the film. You say I. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly what you say. You say, I come from the Midwest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, almost right after that, you say, I come from the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, to me, that's extremely interesting. Because to me, uh, you work very clearly within, from within an American society, t t telling the story of, of, of America, or United States. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, you're uh, like an alien watching from above, uh, 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 or from a distance, mm -hmm. uh, amused and slightly intrigued. And, and to me, I, I, I think it's very interesting to have that jet, that is, uh, um, belonging, jet not belonging perspective mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that, that is why uh, I can be walking and falling mm -hmm. at the same mm -hmm. time. <laughs> and uh, that was a reference. <laughs> okay. uh, and, uh, uh, and, and to, this is how I define myself, so maybe it's just a projection I do upon you. Can but I add there that but, but I actually read that you said also that you, at the same time, are a prefect and a UFO, so it's basically oh. also a double <laughs> side, isn't it? Yes, UFO? And, so I, 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 and, and I think it's interesting mm -hmm. to have that, that double perspective from working from within and working from yeah. outside. Yeah. So please. If you have something to comment on that, I'd um, well, love to yeah, hear it. Yeah, I mean, well, this is a film about up, and um, and also a film about switching um, points of view, of course. The, com the camera angle is so much yeah. up and up and down. Yeah, yeah. and and um, and you're asked to jump uh, so quickly between these points of views. So, one moment you're looking through a dog's point of view, and the next you're the lens of a surveillance camera looking down, or a a hawk looking down at the dog or back up. So, um, or then you're floating through the bardo and you're not really following a, somebody through their dilemmas of a film. It's not the kind of film, it's a constant also questions that, that are. So you have to do a lot of work in this film. It's almost, almost like a radio play, you know. You hear the story of a guy who's, all, again, up, he's up in the trees. He's, um, uh, there's this guy who's lived in our town and I just wanted also to evoke a town from the past. Um, 
this guy just lived in the trees and he pretended he worked for the phone company. Now, if he lived now, he would be taken down from the trees and to a, a, a mental health center and given a lot of drugs to make him feel better. But at, a, at this time, you know, people thought, he's not hurting anybody. And, and especially the men in town were great because they, were, they really did thank him. There was a, Thanks a lot, man, for like, the phones are great now. And he just, you're welcome. You know? and, so, and then he'd go climb down and go back to the house he lived in with his little mom and their little ducks and fritz and the little kind of little chalet. And that was it. It was just, it was fine. And so uh, this, um, but anyway, you never see this guy. All you see is a bunch of telephone poles going by. So it, you have to imagine this, this person, and you get to imagine it as your, as your own person, your own telephone line man who's a little bit crazy. So it, it requires a lot of, of jumping around. Did that answer the question you asked? No, not at all. <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's okay. Okay. But, right. but, it's, but, I, but, I, but I'm still... Because when I thought of you earlier uh, when, uh, as an alien, now I've come to think that maybe you're more either a dog or the one walking the dog. Uh, because in this film, it, it's, it clearly has the dog's perspective. It doesn't have your perspective. And if you're the one walking the dog, you're, the, the dog is actually the main character, yeah. exploring the world, barking, sniffing, peeing, doing dog stuff, and, 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 uh, and I realized when I saw this film that, that in the beginning, you know, with the walk, uh, walking the dog songs you made, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the one that walks the dog is actually the companion, but more of, a, of, a, um, of an observer, mm -hmm. it's like a silent witness, and, and uh, well, I still want to hear more about that. That you, do you feel that you belong, or do you feel that not belong, or do you do this at the same, both at the same time? I think you described it perfectly because it's a, you know I am being walked by the dog as well. Yeah. But it's this the title of this is Heart of a Dog because it it really is like a it's a film about empathy. You know, dogs are extremely skilled at empathy. They mm -hmm. they study us, and I, I aspire as an artist to study. What's going on? Who are you? What, what is your motivation? I mean, that's, that's my interest. And they, they're very, very good at this. I mean, we're also their food supply. So mm -hmm. that's a big <laughs> point. If the, if the situation were, re, re, were reversed and, you know, they were our food supplies, you know, it would be a different situation. Who, the empathetic situation would be a bit reversed and what kind of tricks you'd have to do, et cetera. But I also think that dogs, I'm attracted to dogs because dogs, like us, they admire us, you know, and, and that's very touching. You know, they, they genuinely do, I think. And I, one of the big reasons I think they admire us is because we invented cars. <laughs> <laughs> Speed, and they get to put their heads out the window. And, <laughs> you know, that's, 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 they know they didn't invent cars. <laughs> You know, so they they follow us along, and 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 we like them too, and we're also pack animals as well, and we're concerned about who's head and who's you know we have the same hierarchical situations in many ways as they do, and I'm not trying to anthropomorphize them because they're you know um, I didn't want a piano playing dog, I really didn't want a trick dog, uh, I just wanted a dog, and um, but when but that felt very New York. To me, yeah, she's very uh, very few yeah. Swedish dogs paint. Very few American dogs paint. Either. It's really too, very but, few but, dogs but, but, paint. But if they do, I think it's in in the, the lower Manhattan. Yeah, the village, village specifically. Yeah. yeah, she was a very see and be seen West Village dog. How are you? Hey, <laughs> whoa! I haven't seen you. Gotta have lunch. You kind of yeah. dog, you know. She was very glued to, highly socialized dog, and I had to, you know. And that's one of the reasons I, you know, I felt a little bit guilty taking my dog to California to teach her fear. And it would not be the first time you anyone had learned fear in California, <laughs> but um, she learned it there. And uh, but I only did the piano and painting thing because. When she went blind, she went blind suddenly, just, 
And she did not do well. A lot of dogs do pretty well when they go blind. They don't see so well anyway. And, um, but they hear really well, they smell really well, so they get around just fine. And, um, but she, because she was socialized in that way and was a, um, uh, that kind of dog, she, she froze. And I had to pick her up to take her to the park. I had to pick her up to take her to her water dish. I had to pick her up to take her in her bed. She just wouldn't move. So when I called this trainer, she said, I taught my dogs to play piano. I said, why? <laughs> Well, they were tearing up the furniture when she would leave, and so she said, I, she was a musician, she was from Vienna, a wonderful violinist, and she just decided to train dogs instead, and she th thought maybe it would be comforting for them to do it. And, and in fact, so when Lola Bell began to learn to play, she um, again had a kind of social world, because people would come to the studio, and they'd, Lola Bell's doing a concert at noon, and you know, she'd get treats, and was, you know, she was like, you know, B.B. Uh, King or something like that, playing at that, in her old age, just kind of like, a, yeah, there's a back at this, huh? And um, so she had a wonderful time, and also music fills the space, so in a way, it became a spatial thing. She, she didn't have to move through the space, it filled the whole room, like, just notes filling the space, and music saved her life, and, and I think a lot of musicians would say the same thing. I would say the same thing. Um, it became something that she could do, and that, that, that came a big, big effect of something that she did, so um, it was, um, it worked really well to, to help her to come. And then she began walking around again. Yeah, but uh, one of the more, most moving um, uh, sequences in the film is for me when Annabelle is taken to the beach. Oh, yeah. And she, she dares to run. Yeah. Run I tried that. I tried running after that, after her. Yeah. And it's terrifying. Even though you know there's not going to be something there, that there might be a yeah. dead fish or you know whatever you could chip, or, and it, it's it was really uh, it was really her ecstasy to do that. And also because because you say in the film that that, that I mean that that he had the dog experience freedom, mm -hmm. the, fr the freedom to run run into darkness, and then later on when uh, the first time we get a glimpse from your husband. Uh, Lorraine is on the beach, and I can't help thinking those two scenes have to do with each other. Oh yeah, they do. I mean, in, in the sense of um, uh, freedom, sky, yeah. ocean, uh, uh, liberation. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. and, and you also notice there's a lifeguard stand in the back of that that shot. Yeah. That's like, yeah. Because um, I mean, there. at the same time, I mean, uh, it's it's the the film is sweet, but it's also to me extremely sad. It's it's about loss. Well, it, uh, it's um, of course about loss, and it's about. I'm Swedish. I'm supposed to be very serious. I'm part Swedish too. <laughs> <You know>. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, do you think um, Swedes have more of a into understanding loss? Uh, we're very sad people. <laughs> no, no, I you, think we're sort of more serious. That, I mean, you spoke, you, you said, I mean, we, we, <coughs> uh, we, we, when you ask, uh, how are you, you want, you're supposed to give a short answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the first time I went to America, I was extremely, I had a headache all the time because everybody was saying, hi, how are you, to me. <laughs> and you thought and it was a as question? As a Swede, I thought it was a real question. <laughs> so I started uh, answering long answers like, the, even the first in the custom, uh, you know, at the border, <laughs> the, 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 the guy in the custom said, how are you? Well, I've had a long flight. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, oh, it was yeah. awful because I, think, I do think that it's, we don't have the ready-made ready -made phrases mm -hmm. Americans have. Yeah. So therefore, I think yeah, we, we have to take things slightly more serious. Yeah. And so the greeting here is what? Just Pardon? The greeting here is not how are you, it is just hello and... Yeah, yeah, we say how are you. You say how. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but 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 uh, we don't say no. But not in the supermarket. Mm, they, do, no. they say hi. They, they say hi. They say maybe. Hi. <laughs> do they say have a good day? Have yeah. A nice day? Uh, no. They, do you want a receipt? <laughs> <laughs> they say it's not this. They say hi. How are you? Yeah. Let's get together. Yeah. 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 Kind of stuff. We don't. If 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 we. If you say, let's get together, I will be outside your door tomorrow waiting. <laughs> really, yeah. As a dog, expecting. But you, but you understood quite soon that we didn't really mean that, right? 
Ja. Ja. You picked that up. Was, it was fairly disappointing, yeah. though, because I. <laughs> Here I am. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's only the psychiatrist who said, you know, what kind of a question like, what kind of kid were you? Also, is we're not expecting a long answer. No. Only if I'm a, your psychiatrist mm. and I say, what kind of childhood did you have? And then it's the ten-year answer, you know. Mm. But other than that, it's just short. Mm. It's just like I said, glue. Just yeah. glue. Yeah. But Jonas, uh, uh, if we go way back, I know uh, that glory besides God is one of the reasons for you kind of uh, being an artist. You started out very inspired by glory. Really? As a young boy, you, yes. I've read that you were sitting with your you friend kidding? listening to a song huh. sung by a woman for eight minutes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, can you tell us I a little bit? I can tell you, but I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of doing a justa. Uh, no, we're right not now. doing any justas, but I no. think it's interesting. Because I wanted what it's this to be. It's really nice. No, I love don't him. I love him. I do love him, but I'm, I'm a little bit, I mean, I do want this to be about Laura Anderson, not about me. I'll tell but you yeah. about the justa afterwards, because yeah. otherwise we will. Oh, no, tell us a little bit. A little what? bit. A little bit. A little bit. Of justa? Yeah. No, Ooh. not now. No, we take that after. It's very long. It's very, we don't. I have a little so conflict you, you here. You can tell us what, I mean, this song, uh, Oh Superman, which you... Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. okay. But, uh, uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, oops. <laughs> Doing a small gesta. When I found Laura Anderson and her, her, of course, as many Swedes, we found Laura Anderson with O Superman and the big science record. Because, I mean, since we're not, we're not living in America, we couldn't go to your performances. It was a song that came to us. And it was an extremely important song, I think, for I don't, are there any other in my generation here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say big science was like a new world to us. Uh, not only the... the, the, the um, Sentiment and the and the and the and the and the, and the way you reduced both music and language, mm -hmm. but also to me it was um, extremely important when I wrote my third novel, mm -hmm. which I thought in that novel Prairie Hundana, I think I found my own literal style, like Prairie Dogs, like, like yeah. the Prairie Dogs, Prairie Dogs, yes, and it, yeah, the novel was called The Prairie Dogs. And uh, so the first time I went to uh, America, to New York, uh, my main ambition was to meet Laura Anderson. And I brought with me a letter from the Swedish television telling how interesting I was. <laughs> and uh, my membership card from the Swedish, Swedish Writers Union. And on the back of the card it says, this is to certify that the bearer of this card is a member of the Swedish Writers Union. Any kindness shown to <laughs> this, I remember, will be greatly appreciated by the union. It turned <laughs> out it wasn't the door opener I thought it would be. I went to your Did record. You even I went to your record company. I went to your agent. I showed my card. Be kind to me. Nobody were kind to me. <laughs> I went to see Homer the Brave the first day I came to America. I, I was, was jet lagged. I fell asleep. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so I went, went, went home again, and now when they asked me to come here, I wanted to come here because, because I finally wanted to meet you. <laughs> uh, but also, my husband, Mark, went to the USA uh, the year after, and he, of course, bumped into you. <laughs> it's not hard, yeah. The same second he came to New York in Where? a bookstore. Oh, yeah. And bookstore. In a bookstore, it, it, I think it's at St. Like Mark's that? Place, and he told you about me writing this book, The Prayer Dogs. And so you said you must say hi to this Jonas. And so oh, sorry, here. <laughs> okay. Uh, here I have this um, photo hey, Jonas. from you. Yep, and you wrote, hi, Jonas. Hello from Renaissance. <laughs> and then she drew a little picture same portrait of a small prairie dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Aren't bookstores great? Bookstores are wonderful. Just yeah. People just talk to each other in bookstores. Yeah, and so therefore I came to Gothenburg today mainly to say thank you for... Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Since well, you said hello and I'm a serious Swede, I must come here to say, well, hello to you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, 
Uh, and I, 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 but I do think you had, had an, a major impact, not only uh, 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 on me, but uh, when coming here, I told uh, artists and, and, and writers in Stockholm that I was coming to see uh, meet Laura Anderson, and everybody said the same thing. They said, say hello from me. <laughs> say hi, how are you from yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> how are you doing? Meaning, <laughs> I think they all looked upon you as somebody they sort of knew, so as like a friend, not only like they respect you, and, but, but also I think, I, I think we and admire you, but I also I, th I don't think we are afraid of you. I'm pretty terrified. I know. <laughs> I know. And I might regret <laughs> this, and, but I, I think that's interesting that so many said, say hi. <laughs> Uh, because you have like a directness in the way you talk to us yeah, I, I, that I'm makes us feel like, like we knew you, and of course we don't. No, of course you do. You know, I, it's, it's, I, I aspire to making things conversational, and as I don't like dress up into, in an outfit to do something, I use my actual voice, except when I electronically alter it, which is really a lot of fun, because it, you know, it's a trap being who you are. You know, it's like you, you get your style, you do your style, you keep doing your style, people go, I like your style, then, then they say, uh, Hey, you're not doing your style, or whatever. You know, you're, it's it's kind of a trap, and and uh, so expectation is is really can be a problem, as as you know. Like I know your last book, you know, I don't, and having to like hurdle over to the next thing. Yes. But Hard that's stuff. another interesting thing, uh, talking about the language, the written and the spoken language. I mean, you work with both, and uh, how? What do you think about that? Is it a lot different for you when you work with? speaking and writing, and you do both. How do you relate to the language? I put some written language in the film, too. Now, we, th this had subtitles, right? You must have, like, really gone crazy when you saw that fast written English, and then it's also in Swedish. I feel so sorry for you. I'm so sorry. It wasn't the intention. It was the, uh, to, to have, like, a, a you know, m meltdown. <laughs> but um, the, the, this, this written... Uh, uh, stuff that's to re to be read is was meant to to uh, be language in a different form. Which, because when you read something, it's it's very essentially different from when you hear it. And so I wanted to try to play with that a little bit in, in uh, so some of these words. And they were really directed to uh, the part of you that never speaks, and uh, so that the one who's just kind of back there, you know, kind of watching. Or, and then you send the, this other part out that has the personality with the voice and does the things. And But the other one is just watching, like mine is like watching me just try to act this out right now and it's going, just stop talking. If you're talking too much, you can stop now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know who I'm talking about. This one who who is, I don't know what you'd call it, it's somebody who's back there like witnessing this this thing, who's always been there. And so, uh, and doesn't doesn't use language so much. So, uh, the um, uh, when you write a book, do you feel that? Uh, do you ever read or uh, say things that are in the book, word for word, for example, or do you say things that are very different than the words you would write? Uh, it's a huge difference, I think, with the written with. with Things are right to be read, mm -hmm. and things are right to be spoken. Yeah. It's a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, but also, I, I must say one more thing about, about me admiring you. When I started uh, <laughs> as a comedian, I, 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 I tried to imitate Beth Midler and Laura Anderson, and, and the combination of Beth Midler and Laura was <laughs> Was you? Yeah, it was me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning, uh, but in Swedish, I'd, I'd say, I, 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 I'll, I'll read like this. Uh, den här dagen kommer alla små pojkar. So I, I, I try to sound like Laura Anderson, but in Swedish. Schooling me. And that actually was my, yeah, I think it was <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, um, so to me, when I, when I started as a comedian, I started as a writer reading from my books. Really? So yeah. And wow. then, for some reason, people work? thought that was funny. 
And that was the prairie dogs, the, the book. Did because they, what you why? taught me was actually to dare to use humor. Yeah. To be funny. It's, I mean, it's in the film, the dogs, the terrier says, is it going to be any fun? Because otherwise I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And I think that is you, in a way. Working within Maybe. like a super, <laughs> it might sometimes pretentious performance, you know, art world, you still say, well, okay, I'm an arty, but it will be fun, yeah. because otherwise I'm not interested. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah, and it's, it's not just that it's, it's um, um, I, there's also a lot of sadness in the film, and I put the, in the middle of this film, uh, some, something from my teacher, Mingyur Rinpoche, who's this Tibetan guy who disappeared for four and a half years. Uh, he went to a cave and he just emerged uh, again. But anyway, he was the guy who said, try to practice how to feel sad without being sad. Very hard to do, as, as everyone knows, you know, because there's a really a lot of sad things in the world. And if you try to pretend they're not there, uh, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, it would just come and find you. It'll get you. It really will. So, so his idea is um, to ac accept that, and but not to become it. Absolutely resist becoming that, because his, his idea is that we are here to have a very, very, very good time. That's it. That's why we're here. We're not here to pay for something that we do, you know, somebody else did earlier, or to do something really great, or you know, accomplish a lot of things, or to suffer, or to be, uh, you know, uh, pulled down, but to um, uh, that we're actually going the other way. We're actually we're getting faster, smarter, and happier because you know, we're, even in terms of biology, you know, we're not. We're becoming more complex. We're not sliding back down the evolutionary scale, slowly becoming you know, like a one-celled, slimy thing on the bottom. We're going the other way. So um, uh, that's something that... Now, he's been voted the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> in the Wisconsin uh, Neurological uh, University section of, of the... Um, uh, they do a lot of audio tests and... and, and play extremely uh, difficult to hear uh, things. And those who can keep their equilibrium are, are, are um, called the most, let's say, balanced, happiest people because they, they're not able, they're uh, you know, able to, to do a couple of things at once. Like F. Scott Fitzgerald also said, you know, try to, as his advice to writers, you know, try to, you know, you're holding two things, one in each hand, and each one is absolutely true, and they are absolute opposites. And try to hold those things and not go crazy. That's what you need to try to do, because things aren't, you know, like, uh, you know, you don't have to decide which one is right. So many things are already right. But the heaviness is to try to not go crazy when you, when you see all those things that are, you know, uh, Contradicting each other, I think. So, um, uh, the uh, but I think also expectations. I, I wanted to say one thing about that because, you know, when you start seeing something, when you read a book or you go to a play or go to a concert or something, you, I think people make up their minds really quickly. Is this going to be fun or is it going to be like, this, let's say I'm at a folk rock concert. And it starts out playing and playing, you know, folky ideas, folky chords. And then two thirds of the way into the show, it becomes like opera. And people are like, no, no, I'm at a folk, folk concert. And, and um, especially critics get quite upset. I'm sure you've had this, this feeling. So they, they, they thought it was going to be one thing, and then it became another. And that it's the same way with your, you know, with some of the things that you do. People want you to be predictable. Don't do something out of character because then I don't know where it's going, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so the freedom to push out of that and not do something that's always going to be your style or what you're supposed to be doing is something that's sometimes hard to resist. I mean, a, a lot of, um, uh, I, I think that, you know, I, I see a lot of that as a kind of design problem, really, of, like, let's say, um, something happens to you and you just want to scream and um, 
uh, you realize, you know, oh, well, I'm not really the kind of person who would scream, but you still want to scream anyway. So, and of course, we've inherited a lot of traits from our parents, but many of the things about ourselves we've designed. So you have to then go back to the design stage and say, well, you know, I'm going to just redesign that person who, so I could be someone who could scream if he wants to scream, you know, but not is unable to scream. So anyway, I think that well, the point I'm trying to make in a clumsy way is that we have a lot more freedom to push against um, these borders, I think, than, than we think sometimes, you know. Pretty preachy, I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that, that also times. something you have done, both of you as Preach, artists? Preached. No, but preached, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, as we spoke a little bit about that, you uh, originally you were artists maybe for a more uh, smaller, uh, interested audience, but you both have become very popular for a bigger, broader audience <coughs> because uh, you break boundaries and. I mean, when David Bowie made Let's Dance, uh, people like me were disappointed because he was belonged to, to us. And when he became popular and mainstream, we thought it was, was a, slightly disappointing, even though we were proud of him. And, and do you think it's been, a, I mean, because uh, to me, uh, your work has never been excluding. I mean, it's, 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 it hasn't been that difficult to follow. I'm sure it has layers I don't understand and subtexts I don't get, but to me, I've, well, I've, I've felt sort of included and welcomed into your world and your work. Um, but ha has it been a problem for you uh, being I mean, subculture, main, mainstream, being too popular, being too uh, doing pop records, uh, working within a art? Um, you know, I, Culture. I, I absolutely never think about that. Great. <laughs> I don't. I just never. Th maybe like one, when a long time ago, when I made this art record, Oh Superman, and then it was a pop record. Suddenly, um, <clears throat> I, it, it's. I decided to be an anthropologist and go. This is odd, and and I aspire like. I said in the film, to empathy, I want to see how things work, and so I decided to be a kind of anthropologist of, of this and just see what, what it was. And so um, I, I, I never, I, I'm not an ambitious person either. I mean, I, I'm not a, the kind of artist who wants to open the London office. You know, I don't, I want to be smaller and, and more mobile and uh, freer. So um, I, that's what, um, uh, but for people, for your audience, your followers, were they sort of angry with you? I don't know. Are you angry with me? No. <laughs> no, no, but, but I, mean, I mean, I mean, but, uh, uh, but sometimes I do have aud my aud audience of mine that sometimes feel sort of, sort of betrayed if I do some stuff that gets sort of too mainstream. Mm. I wouldn't worry about it. No, I don't worry about it. Just wonder if you worry. No, I don't think about it. I, 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 I mean, I do really depend on the audience. I'm not saying I don't. I look at people, and I, if an, a lot of people are like, <laughs> I take that thing out. You know, I, I'm working in a time-based medium, and I don't want to bore people. People's time, it, it, it's precious this time, and so I don't want to just sit there like babbling, uh, although it is fun to babble sometimes, but you know, um, uh, so, so I try to, to learn from people and I edit that way but by expressions, and, and I, I like being in a live situation, uh, so uh, yeah. Do you, you do that as well, no? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I like not to bore people. Yeah, now there are also some things that only you think are funny, which what? is kind of wonderful, you know, that uh, unless you're trying to tell a joke to people and then they're like. <laughs> um, that's partly why I started this film this way, in this very geeky sort of like, is this a joke, like giving birth to your, your dog? So I'm not sure that's funny or not. I mean, uh, just weird, really. And I like doing that really because um, I, you know, of, of expectation, you know, do you think you, you go to something, you think you're, ah, I know where this is going. And, and I, I have no idea what 
what plots are or why they why they exist even because I mean I don't know about your life my life does not have a plot just things happen and then other things happen and then I might overlay a plan over the, those random things but it's not doesn't exist do your books have plots <laughs> do, do my books have plots yes they do yes they do yeah mm -hmm. um, I'm extremely conventional I'd say um, in, a mess, in some way, I am. I who are you asking whether your book has a plot? Um, everybody. Oh, everybody. Read. Okay. Uh, but not some <laughs> of you a might specific have person, you know, like some your editor or something. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 I'd say I work. I work within a. I, I, I write television plays, films, and novels that are sort of traditional in the way that they they, they, they go somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Uh, and, I think uh, that's important. That they go, I think it's important that it goes somewhere. Yeah, yeah. and, and I also, I'm also interested in, in, in the construction, in, in, yeah. in, in, yeah. in the book. Uh, yeah, the... What? The yeah, arc. Oh, yeah, the dramatic arc. arc. Yeah. 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 If, 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 I not, if, if I wasn't a writer, I would like to be dramaturg, uh, to, be, to yeah. be working with other playwrights and yeah. writers to find the arc. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's the that's hardest thing, because you know, I know, like in writing records, you can just make twelve songs, and they're like twelve islands, and they have to be beautiful, but they don't have to relate or trade with each other, or they, they can or be catalytic. They're just islands, and and I don't think uh, it's a plot yeah. in this film. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no. But, but no, there, uh, it does. Uh, the, let's say engine, and yeah. that was the hardest thing for me uh, to find an engine in this because. I you know, once made a big mistake, which is I fell in love with a book, uh, Moby Dick, and I thought, this is going to be such a great opera, because I could hear the singing in the book, I just could, ah, uh, uh, and um, I just have a piece of advice for you, if you fall in love with a book, and you're thinking of making a multimedia opera, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> it's like a terrible mistake, because, you know, if you fall in love with something, you, you, you just love it so much, and you don't want to change it. And in this kind of thing, you have to be rough, you know, you have to... And, and also, I lived in the same um, neighborhood that, that Melville did, and I, and I, I thought, he's going to come and find me and kill me. You know, like, my book does not need to be a multimedia opera, thanks so much. But one thing about the engine in that book is that I learned in reading about it while I was writing this thing, was um, <clears throat> that there was no uh, uh, Captain Ahab in this book yeah. originally. And it, uh, and I love imagining this conversation with this editor of, like, um, the editor goes, you know, Herman, it's a great book. It's so interesting. You know, it's got all those ropes and ship lore and, you know, interesting um, things about um, sea life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, basically, it's guys go fishing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, where is this thing going? It's not going anywhere. It's just interesting, bunch of interesting things. And what you need, you need like, how about like a crazy captain? So he invents this Captain Ahab, who does not appear until a third of the way into the book, because he hasn't been written yet. And so he, he appears. And he has this kind of crazy British accent, and he's, he's very Shakespearean. He's very stagey. And I never believed this guy. You know this book, mm -hmm. and you read it. So, I, so these American sailors are like, who is this guy? And he's a kind of like American Lear. He has this, this big rage. He has such rage, and he, you know, it's, it's all uh, somehow embodied in this evil whale. And it never really rang very true to me. You know, it seemed like a very stagey thing to do, but it did move the ship along. It moved it, it gave it a place to go. And so that, I think, is the hardest thing uh, in, in making a, a structured work. Uh, and so I tried to m move my sails by asking a lot of questions and just always uh, having it be a little bit off balance and not r really quite know uh, where you were in this structure. And then to ask consistent questions about, well, really, I mean, wh literally, where are you going? Is it a pilgrimage? Mm -hmm. You know, and what do you want? And so it kept moving that way. And that was the, the, the mechanism, I guess, of, and also the opposite ideas of, 
of what love and language are. So they, I try to pull all of those things in. I just hate Q and A's, you know. <laughs> I, I would swore that I wasn't going to say what I thought this film was about because it, it's, it's a film for you to figure out what it's about. It's a, it, you know, it's just it means whatever you have it mean, and it because it's an open question in that way, you know, it's meant to be, especially the, the end song of... of, of um, it's about my mother. Yeah, it's about moms, <laughs> for sure. That. Everything's it's about, about moms. About, no, it's about my mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your personal mom. Yeah. And yeah. your personal grandma. I, yeah. I, I like her talking to those customers. Uh -huh. I, I'll yeah, never forget really that. Yeah. Our last word is to the customer. <laughs> that's really Time good. flies, so we I think we're going to end with the future. Uh, you're writing on a book, and you're doing a new show. And you, I know, have an upcoming career as a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I think that's a good end to telling okay. us about. Okay, and maybe you can share ideas afterwards. OK. So what's the stand-up uh, project? Well, no, what I'm, what I'm doing, I, I just, um, uh, uh, I'm on my way right now to Brazil, where apparently the Zika virus is, is like threatening the world. Uh, You're the only one going to Brazil right now. Yeah, I'm the only one, and it's an artist colony, and I'm going to be the only artist in this artist colony. So the only colonist. And so I was just asking you, if I, is that the right word, if you're the only colonist in a colony? You know, I mean, you're an idiot, actually, is what you are, you know? So I'm going to be in Brazil trying to swat mosquitoes for the next month and trying to uh, write some things that, um, that I, I don't need a whole lot of technology. Like, I admire that you can just, like, wing it. You don't have to have all these machines worrying, you know? It's no? just, yeah, that's really the way to go. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So let's stop there. Thank let's you go. so much, Lori. Thank much. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You can, yeah. And, uh,